Hey everyone, and welcome back to Citywide Blackout, your home for music, movies, and more. I'm your host, Max Bowen. Well, after reading just a couple chapters of Robert Goldstein's fourth novel, Will's Surreal Period, I have to say I was completely hooked. So it was a blast to talk with the writer about the various ins and outs of the characters, theme, and setting. Robert and I look into the choice that his main character has to make, and how this blends with the other storyline of the dysfunctional family. We talk about his choice to retire in his 50s, pursue writing full-time, and how it's defined him as a person. Robert shares the stories of his first three novels, how they're all tied together and, at the same time, stand alone. We are are talking about the soon-to-be-released book, Will's Surreal Period. This is out on June 21st through a Spark Press Books, and we're lucky enough to have the author here with us, Robert Stephen Goldstein joins us. Sir, it is so good to have you here. I'm really glad that we get to talk about this. Hi, Max. Thanks so much for having me. All right. Now, there's a lot to dive into here. For now, I really want to talk about the book. And this one is all focused on William Wozniak. He is a San Fran artist who's kind of toiling in obscurity for years and suddenly just like that, he's a genius. He is, he, he is painting brilliant art. Until it turns out that it's not just his style, it's also a life-threatening brain tumor. So he's got two choices to make. He can either keep the tumor and be a genius, or get rid of it and go back to being a nobody. And right that alone is enough of a story, but there's so much like more going here. There's his struggles with his wife, his own uh, really dysfunctional family dynamics. But I want to start first off with Will's particular struggle, because wow. This, of course, touches on the struggle that a lot of artists deal with. I'm wondering if this was inspired by any artists you know. Max, pretty much every artist I know is struggling. Uh, (laughs) uh, But this this subplot of the book, because uh, I think you're right. You you touched upon the fact that that there's um, there's there's an entire dysfunctional family and and an ensemble cast of characters. but. yeah, Will Wozniak is uh, is probably the the character with the most page time, and uh, this particular subplot came to me because I, I I came across an article which led me to research some additional articles, and this has really happened to people. Uh, I was uh, I was quite amazed to read about this. I read about a painter and a sculptor, and in both cases, they. Um, They had a brain tumor, and the brain tumor was responsible for them creating amazing art. Uh, There there are even people uh, known as savants who get some kind of brain injury or brain tumor, and they're capable of doing something that that they had never done before. There was a case of a, um, a carpenter who had no musical ability at all, and a brain tumor um elevated him to being a concert pianist. So so these things really do happen. And if the brain tumor is life-threatening, then yes, you have that that precise uh, dilemma. Be famous for your art, which you've been struggling to be for your entire life. And Will is in his uh, early 40s, so it's been a long struggle. Or choose life and live. So yeah, that's... um, uh, but I don't want to give people the impression that this is a um, a morbid or uh, lugubrious kind of book. It's uh, it's actually this book is primarily uh, a humorous romp about a dysfunctional family. But there are heartfelt and serious moments in the individual people's struggles, and this is uh, Will Wozniak's uh, struggle among among uh, the other things you mentioned: his family, his brothers father yeah mm-hmm. i'm a couple chapters into the book and i'm definitely getting the humor especially in the family especially will's father arthur this like <laughs> this like shrill loud cantankerous bastard who has been like systematically cutting will out of his own will all because he had the temerity to leave uh new york um tell me a bit about arthur kind of where he comes from and what his overall role in the story is yeah arthur arthur is very much as you describe him He's um, he's cantankerous. He's um, headstrong, and he has two sons, um, Will and Bert. Bert is a few years younger than Will, and uh, 
because Arthur is so um, egotistical and narcissistic, everything revolves around him. So now that he's getting older, he thinks that his son's primary uh, purposes in life should be to support him and help him. And, uh, and he is a wealthy fellow, uh, despite being um, <laughs> socially maladjusted. He's made a tremendous amount of money doing stocks, uh, stock sales on his uh, computer. So his will is, um, and his, uh, the money he's going to leave, yeah, that's, that's a point of uh, power for him. And his younger son, Bert, dutifully stays home and puts up with Arthur and supports him and takes care of him in all sorts of ways. But Bert is secretly gay. Bert has not come out as gay because his, far, his father, Arthur, is a raging homophobe and would immediately uh, disinherit him if he found out that, that uh, Bert was gay. So <laughs> while Bert, who, who can't make a living, he tries to be a real estate agent, but he's hopeless at it. So he's dependent upon Arthur and, and Arthur's money, but uh, that's keeping him in the closet, which is... Uh, he's approaching 40 years old and it's becoming increasingly undoable for him. So that's part of the tension between Arthur and his son, Bert, and uh, by extension, his son, uh, William, out in San Francisco. I really love the uh, dynamic I'm seeing with Bert and Arthur. You know, Arthur is just like constantly screaming at Bert and Bert's like, gently but very clearly like correcting him or kind of like pointing out where Arthur's like making mistakes and Arthur's like well I, I meant to do that you know what you're talking about go to hell I hate you <laughs> do they even like each other though that's the thing I was wondering just from what I've read I, I think this book this is a novel about a dysfunctional family at its core and I think like most dysfunctional families they do love each other they may not like each other right now but there's a, a core of familial love. You know, one of the uh, one of the mysteries of the book is: will they will they be able to work it out? Do they even want to work it out? <laughs> and if they if they get to a point where they want to, will they be able to? And uh, I'm I'm hoping that this um, this whole sensibility that arises in dysfunctional families will hit home with lots of readers. You know, Max, years ago, I saw a one-panel cartoon that I've never forgotten because it was hilarious, beautifully drawn. I think it was in The New Yorker, but I could be wrong. It was so many years ago. But it was a huge auditorium. And on the stage is a big banner saying uh, annual convention for adult children from fully functional families. <laughs> And then out in the audience, there are, you know, thousands of seats. And in all those thousands of seats, there are like five people scattered in, in the entire uh, auditorium. And, and I think that the reason I've never forgotten that cartoon is because it, it just so succinctly hit on how all of us, almost, uh, almost all of us, I'd say, look at, our, at the families we grew up in. And uh, the the level of dysfunctionality that at least we perceive to have uh, been present. Uh, so uh, yeah, this book taps into that and mines that for uh, everything I was uh, <laughs> able to get. Yeah, families are complicated. Families are very very complicated. What went into though, not just like crafting the family dynamic, but kind of creating the characters and sort of pitting them against each other? Did you, did you use like people you know in real life? This is my fourth novel, and I have never based a character solely on one person that I know. But every character that I've ever written has had bits and pieces of um, at least two or three people I know, plus um, a huge dose of imagination. So yeah, I've seen this kind of dynamic going on in many families, including my own. The, the precise depiction of it in this particular family is, um, is not taken from any one set of, uh, of people. But, but I think it's, it's a pretty common dynamic uh, in lots of families. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Everyone's, there's always that member of the family who is very 
So shall we say not with the times and they just make everything awkward? Yeah. And, and you know, there's a, uh, there's a generational aspect to this, too, I think, uh, especially among families uh, where the, the parents were like first or second generation Americans. And uh, because there's still a lot of the old European uh, thinking, I, I think for a lot of the people who came here seeking religious freedom or uh, escape from, uh, you know, bad uh, oppressive conditions, there, there, there was a very strong family dynamic where people did stay together. They never left the town they were in, and 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 they lived as a big family unit and supported the older people. And then you get to America, and people want to, uh, you know, younger people want to move out and move to different parts of the country and and find their own uh, where they fit uh, and and pursue their art or whatever it is they they want to pursue. And so in addition to just the family dynamic, you're getting the kind of historical generational dynamic mixed in there. Do you think this focuses on, on a particular like time period? Well, it's supposed to be taking place now mm. uh, or, or relatively uh, now. Um, it, it could be five or 10 years ago. Uh, the, you know, people like Arthur who are... Um, old-fashioned, uh, homophobic, so family-oriented. I think some of us would like to say that, you know, they were a relic of the past. They, but I'm not sure that that's, that that's entirely the case. Uh, I mean, uh, you, you just look at the political divide and, and the difference in cultures uh, within America, how differently people see uh, something as simple as uh, wearing a mask to protect yourself from a germ, uh, you know, it becomes such a, a, a fired up political issue. And, you know, um, right now with uh, the, a Supreme Court that is leaning toward putting these questions back to the states, there are some states that will feel a lot more like Arthur does about uh, uh, gay people about gay marriage. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm not sure he's such a relic of the past as some people, you know, some intellect, intellectuals might jump to that conclusion, but I'm not sure that even in 2022, that's uh, a valid conclusion to jump to. Mm -hmm. Very true. Very true. I want to go back to Will for a second. Um, Will, I really like Will. He's a, he, I think he's a very uh, likable character, but his medical situation, what role does that play in the overall book? I mean, does it sort of take a step ahead of the family or is it more in line with it? Well, with, without uh, giving too much away, I think it becomes a, um, a means for the family to try to get back together. Mm. Because um, is, a, a, as much as they may disagree on various things and uh, how ge geographically separated they may be, uh, this is the firstborn son, the older brother, and uh, he may die, or or if he doesn't, he's uh, going to be subjected to brain surgery, and the consequences of that are not always fully predictable. So uh, it does become a potential point of um, reunification. You know, this may be kind of a stupid question, but I'm curious how you would deal with the situation if you were told, well, sir, you have this like life-threatening disease, but you're all of a sudden a genius and you're now going to be more famous than like anyone else. Would you be tempted to kind of just stick with it? Or would you be like, nope, get it out? <laughs> That's actually a great question. Thank you. And, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure that even in the course of writing this book that I examine completely what I would or wouldn't do, but I will tell you this, Max, that uh, I'm I'm 70 years old, so I've had a lot of years to try to figure out who I am. And one thing that be, that has become very clear to me, uh, it took time, and uh, my acceptance of it was perhaps begrudging. But uh, we are not the art we produce. We are not the jobs we do. There, there's an intrinsic being. There is a soul and a spirit and, um, and, and just a, a human being who's capable of honesty and integrity and compassion and kindness. And 
I've, I've come to learn that all of those things are really much more important and much more central to our identity than uh, how many people buy a book you write or uh, how many people listen to a podcast you produce. Uh, you, you know, you do your best and, and you hope you find people with whom your art resonates, mm -hmm. but uh, that's not who you are. It doesn't identify. So I think given that, I would, uh, I would opt to preserve the essence of me rather than uh, the, uh, the artistic output. So do you think of yourself as Robert Goldstein, the writer, or Robert Goldstein, just the person who happens to write? That's another great question. Uh, I, I think the, the latter. Hmm. I am Robert Stephen Goldstein. Um, but, you know, for me, uh, I don't take... I don't take being a writer for granted because it took me a long time to get to the point of being a writer. Uh, I've always wanted to be a writer. I published my first poem when I was seven years old in the school newspaper. When I was in high school, I wrote a short story called Fumatorium that won first prize in the Scholastic Short Story, National Short Story Contest. That was 1969. Uh, I majored in English and creative writing, but I didn't want to be a starving artist. And I, I'm not, I'm just not physiologically or psychologically designed to write all day and then wait tables all night. Uh, uh, so, and then, and to be honest, writing the kind of books that I've always wanted to write, I've always wanted to be a novelist, but the kind of novels I wanted to produce. Uh, take require wisdom, maturity, self discipline, and confidence in who you are. And I didn't have that when I was in my twenties or thirties, anyway. So uh, the the path that I uh, opted to take, <laughs> which which everybody told me would would never work, was just to um, to have a career, work hard, um, live relatively frugally. Uh, and then uh, uh, save as much as I can. And when I'm, when that day hits, and presumably I've achieved the wisdom and maturity and self-discipline that I need, uh, and I have enough money, uh, not to be wealthy, but but to be comfortable and and not let my wife and family down, leave all that and start writing. Uh, and in a way that. That's a gamble. And people told me I'd never save enough. And people told me uh, I, by the time I did, uh, it, I would have lost the fire for writing. But I, I was convinced that I could do this. I'm by nature very patient and uh, very dogged. So uh, it turned out that um, everything came together when I was 56 years old. That was 14 years ago. And that day, pretty much, uh, I was a corporate vice president. I just walked away from it uh, because I, I wanted to be a novelist. I, I, you know, you know this because you interview writers. There are very, very few writers who are fortunate enough to live off writing fiction. And, and you could probably name most of them. You know, you get Stephen King and Danielle Steele and, you know, you could go on, but you, you recognize those names. They're very fortunate. Uh, they, they write, they tend to write novels that are very specific to a genre. They, they have a strong brand. And uh, that's, that's not what I do or what many, what many writers do. If you look at the writers who uh, win the National Book Award or the Pulitzer Prize, and if you Google them, almost every one of them makes a living, you know, as a professor or as a journalist, or they're, they're not making a living off fiction. So I knew that uh, that was not likely. So, you know, I waited a long time to be able to live the life of a writer. So it's important to me to, uh, to cherish every day that uh, I live the life of an artist. Uh, it's what I've always wanted to do. I, I guess that's a very long-winded long answer that I'll sum up by saying I am I am Robert Stephen Goldstein. I happen to be a writer, but I don't uh, I don't take that for granted. I'm I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be there. Mm -hmm. Well said. Well said. Now, when you made the choice to you know to leave your career behind to go into writing, um, when you were like walking out that office door, 
Were you thinking, oh, God, what have I done? Or were you like, hell yeah, let's do this thing? It was, hell yeah, let's do this thing. I had, I had put so many years of thought and planning into it. I remember uh, uh, I called my wife. Um, I had just come out of the, uh, I was a vice president at the time. I had just come out of the office of the senior VP, and we had the conversation. And I took the elevator, but I didn't take it all the way out of the building. I took it to a floor that had different departments so nobody would overhear me. And uh, I called my wife on my cell phone and I said, uh, as I predicted, we had the conversation and it's done. We're going out for Mexican food and margaritas tonight. And we did. And it was a a big celebration. And um, I've really never looked back. It's... um, uh, I think part of this is helped by the fact that I, I'm not a terribly materialistic person. I don't uh, I don't need fancy things, you know. My my wife and I um, we have a nice home in San Francisco. It's not enormous, but it's it's a nice, comfortable home. We have a wonderful dog. We're we're uh, happy people with with what we do. We uh, uh, we have enough to uh, go on a vacation every year or two. You know, nothing terribly extravagant, but things we enjoy. We've been to many parts of the world. So uh, that that's really all I need. When I hear about people who have billions of dollars, I, I wonder what on earth you do with that. Or, uh, <laughs> so, so no, I, I, uh, I, I think I had planned it carefully enough that I didn't have to look back or have second thoughts or doubts. Now, uh, you talk about your wife, and obviously she has been very supportive of your career. You actually dedicate the book to her. Taking a look to the left, we have Rosemary, who, uh, who is uh, Will's wife. She's not quite so supportive of him. <laughs> no, um, no. In yes. fact, their conversations seem to be like walking on eggshells covering landmines full of nails. Um, because Will's always <laughs> trying to be careful to avoid her wrath. It's like, okay, she's had a, a couple drinks. Sweet. Now we can talk. Um, how do you go about crafting that character since she's such really, I, from what I can see, the very polar opposite of your own wife? You know, there's a big debate going on right now, isn't there, uh, uh, publicly, whether, you know, how politically correct is it for any given author to write characters that are outside of their own personal um, experience? So, you know, is it okay for a straight writer to write about gay people? Is it okay for a white writer to write about uh, African-American people? Uh, And, you know, even as something as basic as, is it okay for a male author to write about women? And, uh, you know, clearly as an author, you you have a cast of diverse characters and you're going to write about them. Uh, I I, I tried to craft Rosemary with um, humor, with uh, believability, yeah, she's um, she's prickly, as you say. Uh, I've known I've known lots of women who have uh, similar traits, but I, I think like all the characters in the book, Rosemary grows. So as as the book goes on, um, I think you'll find that Rosemary grows, mellows, matures, um, and and she and Will, especially as Will goes through a period where. He's he's no longer a struggling artist. He's uh, he's the center of attention of the art world. There are there are all sorts of um, changes and uh, growth and movement in their marriage as well as uh, just in their individual personalities. So I, I think you picked up on exactly where Rosemary is when the book starts. Mm-hmm. I, I um, I'd be curious to talk to you when you get to where the book ends if you think you know how much you think Rosemary has actually grown and changed, uh, and if, if you found that uh, enjoyable and believable uh, in context of a reader. Oh, sure. I mean, I mean, people do grow, and pe- you know, people do grow, and they change. Um, I want to ask about just crafting characters, because the characters you have made are very believable as people. Like, I could see them as real folks. Did you have to spend a lot of time building them before you could actually start writing the book itself? You know, <laughs> you flatter me by, uh, by insinuating that I have the uh, patience and ability to uh, outline characters in great detail and uh, outline a book that way. Uh, I don't. Uh, I, I would find that exercise terribly tedious and constraining. I, I wouldn't 
it, it wouldn't wind up being especially creative. And then if I actually did plow through it and have this extensive outline of both characters and plot, uh, the, the act of just dutifully putting it down in words would again be drab. And uh, so I don't write that way. I know there are people who do and they produce very good books. So I'm not, um, I'm not saying that my way is, is the right way necessarily, but I, I start a book with a few basic things. I, I know if I, if I'm writing a, uh, like the, the novel that, that I wrote just prior to this was a serious, um, intellectually and thematically uh, ambitious novel. This novel, Will Surreal Period, from the outset was meant to be a humorous romp. So I know the, the, the basic tone of the book. Is it a comedy or is it serious? Um, and we can talk later if you want about how, how the publishing industry feels about authors who 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 move from one type of book to another. They're, <laughs> they're, they're, they're not especially um, uh, enthusiastic about that. But uh, so I know that I, 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 I know enough about the plot to know a few high points I want to hit. And I have a few main characters kind of cemented in my head, but I'm fully aware that more characters will appear. The characters I know about will grow and change and will make me put them in situations that I didn't intend to. So it's a, it's a real interactive and um, spontaneous kind of act every day to sit down for a few hours and write. And I love that. that that's where all the energy for me comes from. And that's where the best ideas come from. Mm. So uh, these characters grew for me as the book went on as well. Uh, in the case of Bert, Arthur, Rosemary, and Will, because they appear in the first, uh, you know, the first few chapters, I had to know enough about them to at least write their starting points. But they they grow and change a good deal. All of them. Talking about themes and styles, as you mentioned, this book being a very big jump to the left, basically for you from from your from your last books. What led to this? What, what, what made you want to do something a little more comedic, a little more lighthearted? Well, uh, my second book was comedic. Uh, my, my, I, this is my fourth novel. So my, it, they pretty much alternated. The, the first one was serious, second one comedic. Uh, third was very serious and intellectually probing. And quite truthfully, Max, I, I was, um, that book exhausted me. It exhausted me emotionally and psychologically. Uh, I, I mined my 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 past, my soul, my emotions uh, quite quite deeply for that book. Um, that that book was um, an investigation. It was a novel, but uh, the, the the main theme was the perceived rift between science and spirituality, and whether that is a real rift or just a perceived rift. Uh, so I was um, I was pretty exhausted uh, after that, and I I love writing, so I wanted to write another book right away. But I wanted to write a much lighter, funnier, breezier kind of book that would be uh, fun to write. And um, and I I like writing both kinds of books. I like reading both kinds of books. And you know, as I mentioned before, uh, the, the the publishing industry does not encourage authors to uh, deviate. Uh, you know, they're, they they have two mantras in the publishing industry. Uh, one is brand. They want the author to have a brand, uh, an identifiable brand, uh, which means that you're kind of writing the same kind of book every time so your audience knows what to expect. And then there's a platform. They want an author to have a platform, which which is kind of kind of a, a measurement of how many people you know, how much social media outreach you have, uh, how many people have heard of you so that, you know, how many guaranteed sales will you have the, the first week that your book comes out? So <laughs> uh, I, I don't want to pit uh, artists against uh, the publishers, but, you know, that's not really conducive to uh, creating art the way that uh, people would want to. Uh, I, I in no way would ever, ever compare myself to somebody like Shakespeare. But um, 
I was an English major. I, I took a, a whole semester of Shakespeare. He did not have a brand. He wrote uh, silly comedies that were absurd. He wrote uh, tragedies where dead bodies were strewn all over the stage at the end. He wrote histories of kings and he wrote beautiful love sonnets. Um, I don't know if he had a, a publicist uh, who, who complained to him constantly because he, he didn't have a consistent brand. Will, you need a consistent brand. Anyway, I, uh, so I wanted to write this, this kind of book. And uh, I had been thinking about writing a book about a dysfunctional family for quite some time. And I think uh, when I read those articles that I told you about earlier, about the, uh, the artist, the painter and the sculptor who got the brain tumors, that really gave me one of the main subplots. And from there, uh, I, I, uh, the, the book could kind of grow. So I, uh, I knew enough at that point to... Uh, and I had the main, uh, the, the four main characters, at least their starting points, clearly enough in my head. And, and just a few um, high points I wanted to hit. And uh, we went from there. Hmm. If you really want to scare the hell out of uh, your publicist, write like a horror novel next time around. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know which way is up. Uh, <laughs> that would be frightening on, on more than one level. Right. <laughs> I don't know. I think you could do it because you have such a gift when it comes to characters. And I think the really good horror stories are have characters. You know, it's not just about like, you know, a body count and scary ghosts and all that nonsense. It's about it's funny, people too. It's funny you should say that. The uh, You know, I mentioned um, when I was talking about uh, the fact that I won first prize in a f short story contest mm -hmm. when I was in high school. That was actually a, a horror story. I had been reading tons of Edgar Allan Poe and uh, of a lesser known writer in that style named Gerald Kirsch who wrote in the 1950s. Uh, and I had been just immersing myself in those kinds of stories. And that happened to be the, the kind of story uh, I wrote that, um, that won that award. And I really haven't written much horror since. So that's a good idea. There you I'll go. put that on there my you list. Go. Yeah. Because I, I personally, my, my own thoughts on the merit, and, I, and I'm not a writer, but I feel like a writer should write whatever they want to write, you know? Sometimes, yeah, you do have to kind of write to what the market wants if you want to be successful and sell a bunch of books. But at the same time, if you're writing something that isn't you, then it's not going to come out with the same passion if you're writing a book that is you. I, I could not agree with you more. And that, that was part of what went into my thinking of, you know, waiting until I didn't have to depend on the books for, um, you know, for, for monetary purposes to make a living to write because I'm, I'm free to write what, what is meaningful to me. And what I hope, you know, uh, like every writer, I, I certainly want to uh, get readers with whom my books resonate. Uh, but, you know, I'll settle for a few, just a few of them if, if they're truly tuned into what I'm writing. And, uh, you know, I may not be writing books. I know I'm not writing books for the, you know, the grand uh, reading demographic. Uh, I, I don't read books that are written for the grand reading demographic, uh, you know, and I don't see those are not the films I see or the music I listen to either. So, you know, there are many of us who who live on um, various uh, uh, margins of uh, popular culture uh, and. Uh, we're we're happy where we are. Exactly, exactly. All right. Um, I want to ask now about perspective because this book is written from the third person perspective, uh, but your other books were written from first person. What led to this change, and how do you think it impacts the book? It's a very interesting uh, question. Um, I didn't know you knew enough about my my prior books, but you're exactly right. Uh, my prior books were all in first person. This is not the first time I've ever written in third person. I've written short stories in third person. But uh, for people who don't write and who have never stopped to really think about this, there's a huge difference in perspective. When you're writing in first person, one of your characters is narrating the story. So you have the ability to get very, very deep into that person's psyche, into that person's head. And you can explore that person uh, 
with, with all sorts of nuance. But you are then constrained to see every other character and every other situation through that character's eyes. My, my prior novels really fit for that because there was one really main character and seeing everything through that character's eyes uh, worked. Will's Surreal Period is much more of an ensemble cast. Things are happening in different parts of the country. Things are happening with different members of the family. And by putting it in third person, you're able as a reader to read segments that are seen from the point of view of one character or another. I would, um, the, the, the term for this technically is close third person, which is just a way of saying that rather than having an omniscient narrator narrate the whole book, uh, each segment is actually kind of subtly narrated from the point of view of one of the characters who happens to be in that segment. And it's not, um, they're not speaking in first person and it, and you might not even be aware that uh, unless you stop and think about it, whose eyes you're seeing this particular segment from. But I love the fact that I was able to get into the, the minds of so many different characters. Uh, and because it's an ensemble cast and so much of the plot revolves around different people in different places, will they or will they not eventually come together? Uh, it, it was the, the right way to tell the story. Oh, it definitely was. It definitely was. Okay. Your first novel was uh, The Swami de Hefner. Then you wrote um, Enemy Queen next. And your third book was um, uh, Cat's Whisker. And of course, now you have Will's Surreal Period. Does anything connect these books? Yes. Every, in every novel that I've written, there is one character who has a spiritual awakening during the course of the novel. In the two serious books, The Swami de Hefner and Cat's Whisker, that, 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 that kind of um, mystical illumination, that, that, that spiritual uh, awakening is, uh, is primary to the, to the plot and theme of the novel. In uh, the two comic novels, Enemy Queen and Now Will Surreal Period, it's, um, it, it's, it's a much more minor part of the book, but I don't think I could or would ever write a novel that didn't have that in it somewhere. There was a well-known cartoonist, a caricaturist, I can't remember his name now, but he had a daughter named Nina, and he always secretly put her name Nina somewhere in the curls of somebody's hair, or uh, uh, he, he, he did all those famous Broadway uh, caricatures um, of Broadway stars anyway. Uh, so I think um, people who, who are careful readers of my novels will, will find that. Um, and, you know, again, here in Will Surreal Period, it's, it's, a, um, it's, it's not a major part of the book. And if that's not your cup of tea, uh, the few pages that are spent on it, uh, I hope will not dissuade you from uh, enjoying the rest of the book. But that's an important thing. For me, it was an important thing in my own life. I, I think it's, um, it's something that is important enough to me to include in every novel I write. I've also seen a few other kind of bits and pieces of you in the book, um, not in just in this book, but also in others, whether it will be uh, your devotion to um, uh, yoga, vegetarianism, and of course, the spiritual uh, side of you. Did that kind of happen just by accident or was it just sort of something that you wanted to make sure it kind of got in the book in some form or another? Yeah. Yoga, meditation, vegetarianism, and compassionate living are kind of the, the four legs of my own spiritual uh, step stool, you, you might say. And uh, they're very important to me personally. So, uh, there are things I know a lot about, so I do tend to write about them. I would say um, Will's Surreal Period has relatively little of that. There's a lot of food in Will's Surreal Period, food and cooking, and more so as the book goes on. Uh, it becomes a, a pretty central theme. Uh, 
and um, again, could be something that 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 could potentially help bring bring a dysfunctional family uh, back together. Uh, and if I'm when I'm writing about food, uh, there are certainly uh, pot roasts and steaks and chops in the book, but uh, there are also, um, especially near the end, there's uh, there's an awareness of um, vegan uh, cooking by by people who are getting into catering and uh, you know people who are looking for caterers for a vegan wedding and uh, or or as we like to say now plant based, uh, which sounds so much less uh, overbearing than vegan. Yeah. Uh, I would say in my comic novels, those things are not major themes. Uh, yoga was a big theme in the Swami de Hefner. Meditation was a huge theme in Cat's Whisker. Uh, although he uh, that, that character liked to meditate on, um, <laughs> begin his meditation sessions with uh, scientific analysis. So it's a, it's a different, it's, it's kind of a, an attempt to merge the, uh, the corporeal and the spiritual aspects of the, the cosmos. But uh, yeah, it's it's interesting that you picked up on that. I, I don't think that there are overwhelming or overbearing themes in Will's surreal period, but you'll, you'll find hints of um, mm, not so much yoga or meditation, but, but certainly some hints of vegetarianism in there. Um, there um, there's also, uh, little little bits of playful sex, probably in all my novels. Um, sex that perhaps deviates somewhat from uh, the uh, the traditional mis- missionary posture. You know, um, sex is part of life, and I when I'm writing about people's lives, I, I like to write at least a little bit about uh, their sexual lives. Um, I don't know about you, but I find just um, regular plain old sex, while, while it may be very, um, very enjoyable to engage in, it's, it's, it, it, for me, it's not that terribly enjoyable to read about or to write about. Uh, it, it, you, <laughs> there's not a whole lot new that's uh, being introduced. You know, I do write about people who experiment a bit with, with things that are gentle and fun and consensual, but, but a bit out of the ordinary. And I think that's in all my books. And there's certainly a bit of that in uh, Will's Surreal Period. I don't think, again, that it's, uh, it's a major theme, but, but you'll find uh, little bits and pieces of it there. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm really curious to read uh, to read uh, the rest of it because I want to get all these like little little uh, bits and pieces. <laughs> um, I also want to ask about setting. So this book is set in San Francisco, partially, um, and that's where you live. Were you able to include any like favorite spots or parts of the city that you like really love? I, I think there's a little bit of that. You get the flavor of San Francisco. My books are very much about the characters and what what's going on in the characters' heads. Uh, so where they are is somewhat less important. When the book starts, um, the father, Arthur, and his son, Bert, are in uh, Westchester, just north of New York City. And uh, Bert is spending time down in Manhattan. Uh, and I was born in New York, so I'm familiar with New York as well. Uh, I, I moved to San Francisco when I was 22, so I've been living here for almost 50 years. I, I'm familiar with both these places. So I, I do tend to set a lot of things in those two cities, although I've, I've uh, Enemy Queen, uh, my second book, took place in uh, North Carolina, where, um, <laughs> do, do you remember the... Uh, the great event that was called Y2K. Oh, yes. I yeah. remember being very, very disappointed that nothing happened. Yeah, I mean, nothing happened. Really? It, I mean, I was waiting for that. I was waiting for the lights to go off and else, and else to be like knocked back to the Stone Age and it didn't no, happen. Because, I thought, huh. right, there, was all, there was all kinds of fear and loathing anticipating Y2K, which meant that um, if you were a, um, I, I think at the time I, I was a director level a uh, person uh, su- uh, supervising uh, software engineers. Uh, 
because of all this fear, there was a tremendous need for consultants to go all over the country and help people assuage their fears and put and, and get their software of Y2K compatible, which turned out to be a lot easier than uh, people thought it would be. But um, I, I actually went into consulting for a couple of years in 19, nine, late 1998 and 99 because there was so much Y2K. And that's where I worked uh, pretty much full time for about seven or eight months in North Carolina, which was very different for me. Uh, having grown up in New York City, um, live in San Francisco, you know, uh, I was uh, I was a real foreigner down there, especially, you know, in the 1990s, um, it was perhaps a bit more uh, parochial. Um, uh, than it is now. So it was very interesting. And it's also just a beautiful, beautiful state. If you've spent time in North Carolina, the, the, the trees, the uh, it's just gorgeous. It's one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen. And I remember when I was there working and working because I, you know, I, I was still on this mission to retire eventually and write. I said, I'm going to set a novel here one of these days. And so uh, I had the patience to make it my second novel. But uh, yeah, I'm very glad I set a novel there. It's a, it's a lovely place and a very interesting place and very, very interesting people. You know, the, this mix of um, southern, um, southern hospitality mixed with... Um, rather traditional and, and often conservative political points of view, but people who are very welcoming personally, it's, it's, it's a fascinating, um, it, it, it's just a fascinating uh, sensibility to immerse yourself in it. If, um, if you're a northerner and, and you've never really been down there, uh, I found that fascinating and it was fun to write about. Okay. Now, when you first began writing, did you have any expectations about what that lifestyle was going to be like? Did you see? Did you think it would be a certain a certain flavor or a certain speed? I have read a lot about writers. the The two things that uh, novelists said were the most difficult uh, did not prove especially difficult for me. Uh, the, the two things I had read a lot about one was just the sheer amount of time you spend alone, right? You, you're, you, how many hours a day do you sit alone writing? You know, it, it can be, in my case, it's probably five or six. Uh, some people, it can be eight to 12 uh, hours a day. Um, so that's a lot of time to spend alone. I'm, I'm by nature uh, extremely introverted. I, I think I've matured enough in my 70 years to get along well with people, and I do okay in social situations. I'm not, um, <laughs> I, I'm not a human misfit in, in that in that way, but uh, I, I I don't mind spending hours alone every day. So the other uh, issue, I remember Norman Mailer talking about this, uh, was consistency of uh, voice. So if you think about it, what, what, what he said was difficult for him was that if it is, so how long does it take you to write a novel? In his case, it took a year to a year and a half to turn out a novel. And, and his, uh, his complaint or his lament was that you have to sit down every day and get into that same voice, which means getting into that same head, uh, thinking the same way, feeling the same. And I guess he was, by nature, a very volatile fellow. If you ever saw him interviewed, uh, Dick Cavett used to have him on incessantly, uh, often <laughs> intentionally with Gore Vidal so the two of them could scream at each other. Uh, but, you know, he was a very volatile, mercurial kind of fellow. So I guess for him, yeah, that, that must have been very difficult to get into the same head every day. I, I, I tend to be, by nature, very even keeled. Uh, so, again, that was not a, a problem for me. And the first book, you would expect that if you haven't written in years, um, other than, you know, I, 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 I was doing a little bit of writing here and there, uh, uh, not, um, not nearly enough to, um, <laughs> to, to make the sudden leap into writing for hours every day. 
you would expect to have some kind of writer's block or fear of what you're going to put down on the page. The, the, the truth of the matter is that first novel, the Swami de Hefner, I've been thinking about since my 20s. And uh, yes, I was a corporate executive. I was a good one. Uh, I think I was a compassionate, fair, and honest one, which is not always the case and not always the easiest way to be if you want to uh, be accepted. But I will confess that, uh, you know, as a corporate executive, you sit through endless meetings every day. Your entire day could just be one meeting after another. And if you sit through a meeting that lasts an hour, there may be five to 10 minutes of it that's really relevant or uh, important. And the rest of it is just a lot of people pontificating and a lot of drivel. So there's a lot of time to just think and make notes. And people think you're making notes about, you know, the, what they're pontificating about, but you may secretly be making notes about that novel that, that you've been thinking about since your twenties. So when I sat down to write the Swami de Hefner, uh, I was 56 and I've been thinking about that novel for over 30 years. I had pretty much every scene written in my head. So that novel was, uh, different. You know, all the other novels, as I said, I, I kind of write as I go. That one had been cemented in my head to the point where I didn't even uh, write it in, in in sequence. I just wrote whatever bit of it popped into my head that, that morning that I'd been thinking about. And of course, as I wrote it, it grew and, and other characters came in and it, it did it did take on a life of its own. But there was enough of it in my head that I didn't have that fear of, oh, what the hell am I going to put down on this blank page? You know, is it going to be any good? Am I a fraud? Uh, I, I, I would not encourage most people to wait until their mid-50s to, <laughs> to begin their artistic career, but uh, there, there are some advantages if you do, and I guess that, that was one of them. Hey, it worked for you. What's next for you? This book, again, is out on June 21st. Is there going to be a book tour, some signings, or are you off to the next book? I'm off to the next book. You know, the, the pandemic put such a, a dent into book tours. And, and uh, I know for Enemy Queen, I, I had book signings uh, scheduled, and then they got canceled because the, that book came out in May of 2020, and the pandemic started in what, March of 2020? Mm. So nobody, by May, nobody even knew what they were up against. Mm. They knew they were up against something formidable, but they had no idea how formidable or how to approach it. So everything just got canceled. And uh, I realized that uh, for a writer such as I, you know, if, if, you're, if you're a well-known writer, if you're Stephen King and you show up at a bookstore there are going to be a lot of people going in there who, who uh, want to get your signature and read it. You know, if I show up at a bookstore, I, I think I'm showing up with a really good book, but, you know, maybe 12 or 15 of my friends know about it at that point, and they're going to buy the book and support me anyway. So, you know, to, <laughs> honestly, uh, you know, and I had this discussion with my publicist and she seemed almost relieved that, that she finally found a writer who appreciated this uh, this sad truth, you know, for for the average writer, how important is it to have a book signing? Other than to feed your own ego, wh what is it accomplishing? Uh, I'd rather I, I'd rather uh, continue work on my next book. I'm about a hundred pages into my next novel, and uh, I'm very happy with it. I think I'm going back to the serious uh, kind of uh, thematically uh, ambitious novel. I'm refueled now to do that. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to get going on it full time. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Robert, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate this. I am just loving the book and I will definitely be uh, getting to the end of it, sir, because I want to see how everything turns out. Max, it's been a pleasure. You're a very charming, intelligent fellow. And, uh, I'd, I'd love to stay in touch. Um, you're, you're a good man. Thank you so much for inviting me. Take care and be well. And you too, sir. And for the folks at home, check out Robert Stephen with a V, Goldstein.com. You'll find all the information. 
Links to the books, of course, buy them, folks. I say this a lot. I'll keep saying it because it's really relevant. Leave a review. It can be stars. It can be a big thumbs up. It can be a nice little essay. It can be two sentences, whatever. We like the engagement. It helps the author follow their socials, share their stuff on Goodreads. Whatever you do, keep engaged because that's how we all make this work. And definitely, sir, we'll be talking again real soon. Take care. Thank you. Hi, this is singer Kate Eppers, and you're listening to Citywide Blackout. Picture this. You finished your first book and nailed it. The plot, the characters, all the twists and turns. This one's a winner, and all you need is the right cover. If you've got my art skills, this is the part where panic usually sets in. Enter the cover villain. Hero to writers everywhere. Founded by noted author Remy Flagg, Cover Villain focuses on composite image covers for science fiction and fantasy writers. Give them the details, and they'll craft a cover using popular trends that everyone will want to see. But wait, you say, I've got ideas of my own. No problem, as Cover Villain loves a good collaboration. As they say, our goal is to put a little villain in every cover we make. Want to know more? Then head to CoverVillain.com and follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Okay, everyone, that brings this episode to a close. Big thanks to Robert for joining me, and definitely check out the book, Will Surreal Period, now available. I guarantee you are going to love it. You can follow the show on Facebook under Citywide Blackout, and Twitter and Instagram under Citywide Max. Get at me at citywidemax at yahoo.com, and check this show out wherever you find podcasts, as well as every Saturday at 10 p.m. on Boston Free Radio. As always, keep those ears open.